Well, hello and welcome to the third of these interviews that I'm conducting with Tony Hurl, uh, Canon Tony Hurl, as he leaves St Paul's, retires from St Paul's after 28 years of very fruitful ministry at uh, St Paul's in St Albans. We've been tracking back his, his life over the past two interviews. Uh, I think we arrive at a time now where Tony is about, about 30, uh, has just married uh, Lydia, is beginning a curacy at, uh, uh, I, I, want to get, I want to get this right, at St Mary's Stoke in Ipswich, where Tony will be for, for uh, at least three years, and then going on from there to St Patrick's in Barking, a very different church, uh, from 1987 on to 92, and in 92 Tony comes to us at St Paul's. So my first question, Tony, is looking at those those churches, a church in Ipswich, a church in Barking, as I, as I said, I would have thought very different churches. What was it that you learned from those churches that you brought into your ministry at St Paul's? Lots, lots and lots. It's <laughs> formative years. Um, one thing was that I think the valuing of the whole church. I'd come from brethren which were sort of... Uh, thought of themselves as a complete group but had virtually no relations with other churches although my father did in fact and we did um but seeing the different varieties of anglicanism and i went on placement in Wycliffe to a church which i struggled with in a way it wasn't uh, it was probably more political than uh in my view doing the gospel sort of stuff but it was a very formative uh experience because one they had the hungriest bible study group i've ever known in any church i'd been in there so what you saw on the cover wasn't what you found inside with some people. But secondly, when someone local just came one Sunday and they were desperate and they came there and said, I want to find God. And I sort of said to them, welcome here. I hope you do. Um, should you not find it helpful here, do go down the road to the Baptist church. Uh, because you were conscious that if not every church doesn't come alive, certain people know which church to go to. But actually every church is to be an outlet and i can remember stephen cottrell who's going to be the archbishop of york uh saying how he was expecting a baby in those years and uh, he said I, you know there are two hospitals in bradford where he lived one's got a maternity unit guess which one we'll be heading for at the time and every church needs a maternity unit so that helped me going to this church in ipswich which was very unlike anything we'd done lydia had been there first she'd been there for two years she spent her time a lot praying, encouraging the vicar. There was God's statement in it. One, she'd been encouraged to go by saying all the things about her and then saying to the person, do you still want me? And he did. And some in the congregation said they'd been reading Acts and Lydia coming over. So it felt a God time. And my incumbent there was a lovely man, but I think he'd struggled and he does he was interesting, Lydia's father was adopted and he was adopted, well, he was fostered and he'd gone through the same mission of hope that Lydia's dad had been through. So there was a sort of, again, an understanding there. Um, but he didn't, he was lovely, but I think he didn't know how to change. And the bishop put Lydia in to really encourage him and help him when he got discouraged. And I went there and in a way I had the privilege of starting all sorts of things so it started with a church where you um you could do anything so I learned all sorts of things there but it was that sort of love of the whole church which I think still is part of my bit here of doing St Albans church leaders and and the respecting of the different churches which I think in my young years I would have dismissed so that was one area uh, second area was the whole thing with the spirit. When I was at Wycliffe, there was a little charismatic prayer group. Um, but as I arrived in Ipswich, and it was out of every sort of, of the normal circles of our sort of um, situation, God got me on Romans 15 about God fully preached the gospel. Paul saying in the throwaway line, I fully preached the gospel by word and deed with signs and wonders. And I just knew that I'd not seen signs and wonders in any gospel presentation um, in the way that they are in scripture. And that's started a whole journey. Anglican Renewal Ministries was part of it. I used to go to St Andrew's Chorley Wood days and they were leaders days, but we used to, to pack up people from the congregation and take them as I made them leaders in the car going up to there. 
Um, and we saw wonderful things of, of them being healed. I remember one time we took four people up in the car and they all had different experiences. And one had had a baby outside marriage and they were from a strong Christian family. So it was all full of, and they felt God say to them, you must enjoy this child. And that was so strategic. Remember another man who uh, was cheerful, but had bouts of depression. And he sobbed his heart out and remembered pulling his father out of a gas oven, out of the gas oven when he was trying to commit suicide at the age of eight or nine when he came home from school. And you just saw that God was liberating. And I also went to the Wimber conferences there, um, uh, to Harrogate, and that was amazing to see. I can remember still the shock of realising that when John Wimber had this sort of relaxed time of healing, he was genuinely surprised someone, her pain hadn't got. And you just thought, this is a different order to anything I've seen. Uh, a man behind me was a curate somewhere, and I saw his face, um, a sort of snarl come of it as this demonic spirit um, manifested and then went. Um, you just saw things happening. And it was at the end of Barking, we then joined um, New Wine. So the first year of New Wine, which has been a feature, and I think probably the greatest influence for our kids. And there was also HTB in the mix. So those were sort of strands going through of this learning in a way, in a place where, um, oh, it's funny at St Mary's Stoke, they'd never thought of probably praying non-liturgical prayers. So that was an innovation we bought. But there was a little old lady who came up to me one day when I talked about uh, God speaking to us. And she said, I've never told anyone this, but three years ago, um, I was ill. I had a hiatus hernia. She was in her eighties. And she said, I heard an audible voice say to me, my grace is sufficient for you. And she said, I'd only got the cat there. I live on my own. And I thought I was going loony, but it wasn't that sort of meeting. But I hadn't told anyone because I thought they would think I was loony. That night, her hiatus hernia blew up, as it were. She went into hospital. In those days, they opened the whole of your chest. And she said, I just knew my grace is sufficient for you. And she'd recovered. So you saw God working in situations where, as I say before, I'd have perhaps said, oh, there's nothing happening there. But sometimes it was below the surface. I mean, it's worth, it's worth remembering that we're, we're, we're talking about the, the 80s when all these things were new. Perhaps, perhaps these days, um, the whole charismatic movement is, is, is very strong in, in, in this country. But you're, you're, you're looking back to the days when John Wimber was coming over from the States and the spirit was just beginning to move. So these must have been very exciting times to be involved in, in, the, in the early part of the charismatic movement, Tony. Well, they probably were, but in a way I, I was so isolated from other things. I mean, there was a lovely church next door with a very high church vicar who said he'd been a vicar for, uh, for 20 years and a Christian for 10, um, which was quite interesting, um, a lovely man. And um, so God was on the move. And again, in the Mission England that came, that was quite significant. Um, Mission England came um, and uh, Billy Graham came to town. He came to our parish because we had the football ground in our parish. And uh, I met there again other Christians. So there was a very, the highest church in Ipswich. A lovely man there was involved with Mission England. And I used to cover for him when he went on holiday. And he used to dress me up, you know, in robes, which I didn't know the names of and stuff like that, because I'm not very well taught on that stuff. And I knew he wasn't, I'd thought bowing at the altar was idolatry, and I knew he wasn't doing idolatry. But you could talk those things through and get rid of some of your corns. And it was funny because my first vicar probably kept many more saints days than I did. And I probably had St. John Stott. But I saw the danger of of things we think we're strong on, we're actually weak on. So I think most evangelicals believe in the sovereignty of God, but they're more liable to try and fix things by manipulation and not trust God. So what you say you're strong at. And so with the spirit stuff, it was, it was exciting. It was also fun because we set up, I set up a parish weekend. Um, we set up marriage preparation and, and uh, wedding preparation. I set up um, home groups. We did that off the back of Mission England. I felt what it was to be excluded by Mission England because we, because we weren't this sort of well-known church. Um, there was a, they were going, we edited their manual to include the sacraments, but that was the only change we'd made to start our home groups. And that, that seemed in, 
in tune with what they were wanting to do initially. But I then heard we'd been, we weren't going to be referred to, uh, have, have candidates referred to us. And we were taking quite a lot of people to it. And uh, I went sort of fairly ballistic. And in the end, the head of Mission England for Eastern uh, England came and put his arm around me and said, you're right, you know, because you've come back in. Um, and it was that experience of if you weren't in the right setting, uh, you could be judged. But actually, God was working there. So they were profound lessons of, of God's much bigger than we are. And yet God can work. And in these sort of back alleys. And we had this Christian basics group. I put it together. And we used to make the, the upper bedroom of our house. It was a Victorian terraced house with a bay window. And we could get 17 chairs into the upstairs bedroom. So that was the church lounge. And we did the wedding preparation, the baptism preparation, and the Christian basics group there. And I can remember one lovely man came once, and he was coming out of politeness. He was very clever. His father was a director of Sainsbury's. His wife had wanted the child baptized, but they were, yeah, lovely, lovely couple, but he was an atheist. And about halfway through this course, he had this thought that actually Christianity might be true. And he went off to his parents in Herefordshire for, Christmas, uh, for Easter. And on the way, he called at the SBCK bookshop in Hereford and bought, as he was the sort of person he was, the history of the interpretation of the New Testament, 1861 to 1961, by Stephen Neal. The bishop, Stephen Neal, was old then and had taught us at Wycliffe. And uh, he read that till four o'clock in the morning, became a Christian. Within 18 months, he was going into the ministry. Uh, which was extraordinarily fast for the system, but he was his own man. Um, and what was interesting was he hit a lot of opposition from his, uh, his uh, wife's parents. And he wasn't used to sort of conflict and he wrote it all down. And then he felt they just must go. And the thing that the parents really struggled with was their kids wouldn't go to public school and that they would be poor during this time of training and they'd live in not very good conditions, as it were. And just before they, they made the decision to go, just before they went, their house sale fell through. So they rang up Salisbury Theological College and said, we're not sure we can come. You know, our house sale's fallen through and we can't buy the house the other end. And Salisbury Theological College said, ah, oh, well, that's fine. Um, we just had the offer of a house in the close. And so they lived in the close for three years and their daughters presented the bouquet to Princess Diana at the cathedral uh, concert of the spire which was televised and you thought this is just amazing isn't it how God can fix it if you put him first he can fix situations as to where will you live while you're training and, and, and I think one of the things one of the themes that's coming through of of what you've been telling us over over these these interviews is is about God's provision isn't it the way that God will provide and that's another story that's an example of of that of course, the two other very important events happened during during your thirties, in in that uh, your son John was born while you were at Ipswich, and and Ruth was born while you were in Barking. So you had two small children, yourself and Lydia, to also juggle during those ministry years. How how did that work out? Uh, Lydia's been fantastic with the kids, and she's been a, a a source of I think praying. I don't think much would have happened in my ministry without her her prayers. Um, and she's been great with the kids of being present to them. Her mum was good with her. She was a vicar's wife, her mum. And the kids not having to, we felt they should come to church with us on a Sunday morning because that's what we do as a Christian. But they didn't come Sunday evening. So she gave herself to them. She was always much better than I that laying down tasks to listen to them or uh, she used to, uh, you know, be available for them in a in a wonderful way. So when uh, you know, there were struggles at school, she would often listen sometimes late into the night. And I think they were able to process stuff then. Um, so she was she was wonderful. Um, and I think, yes, as a family, it helped us. I mean, it was it, it was funny, I think when we moved to Barking, that was the third lowest take up of tertiary education in the country. So there was um, I think my parents were quite concerned of going to that sort of area. Her parents were fine with it because he'd been a vicar just down the road in Dagenham. But if you follow God, you can go. It's safer to be where he is if that's in a war zone, isn't it? Than, than being on your own and choosing. 
so we had a wonderful time in Barking. Um, we learned too how God answers prayer in ways you don't expect. So in Ipswich, there were no children. And the vicar hoped there would be children. And we prayed for children. What we didn't immediately recognise was the first family. I still remember them. And uh, they had three kids and they were fairly snotty nosed and they were fairly rampant. They were fairly dysfunctional. And the first week they just moved around reasonably noisily. But the second week, they, one of them bought wooden clogs and ran up and down the pews. And it was a church which had a choir and, and if looks could have killed, they'd been dead many times over. But they didn't realise, and uh, Dennis the vicar was wonderful at welcoming them. And so that was the start of our children's work. And then the next family who came were reasonably, well, slightly perhaps dysfunctional because they didn't mind their kids playing with the other one's kids. And it took us to get to about 10 kids. And you just realised that God has different ways of working. When we moved to Barking, we longed to get some leaders to move in. And then we discovered that actually it's better to grow your own. And there were wonderful leaders there, but because the mood was, I think, lower self-esteem, they wouldn't step up if there were others around. But by God's grace, people didn't move in so that we developed those leaders and they're still going today. So you learn a bit how God's ways are our ways. Um, and he surprises you, but he's faithful and amazing. And I also learned in Barking, we had a very difficult situation, which was, uh, I suppose, where I shared what some people go through at work. And we did at one stage wonder whether, uh, how it would work out. And there was just difficulties such that we felt we might even leave the ministry and keep integrity rather than stay in the ministry and lose it. Never came quite to that. But the one particularly difficult weekend, and we had a wonderful church warden there who was... Uh, a godly man but not a great scholar and God spoke to him on my behalf um, and he said tell Tony not to worry and there was a verse for the church but there was a verse for me which was Romans 12 21 now he didn't know his bible that well I didn't know my bible that well but Romans 12 21 is don't become don't be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good and so we knew so God helped us in that situation and we I was on a license it was going to be extended and then it was uh, not extended so in the April uh, I was told there was four months before I had to leave Barking and that's not long and it was 1992 when there was a recession so there were no churches around and it was funny because in the difficulties there'd been one particular difficult time and I think a little old lady in the mother church had sort of she never said anything, but I think she'd noticed some things. And so we'd written to the surrounding bishops to say, was there any uh, chance of a job? And uh, gone to the Church of England, all that sort of stuff. And this little lady came to me and said, my daughter hasn't got a vicar. And I ignored her because I'd written to this, this diocese. It was St. Albans Diocese. And uh, the bishop here had said, um, you yeah, know, there were no livings going. And uh, the Bishop of London had said he could number the number of free livings on one hand and all that. And so she came again the second time and uh, she sought me out and she said, you must apply. I, um, my daughter still hasn't got a vicar. And so I rang the only people I knew in St Albans, which was Marion and Andy Brown, who I, they were my first wedding when I was ordained three weeks. I got special permission to do their wedding. So I rang them and they said, ah, Andy's the church warden and Marion's the administrator. You must contact the vicar of St Peter's. And so in the June, we came and looked here. And uh, it was funny because we came, I suppose, probably a bit obviously, but we were coming discreetly. Philip Haversham talked to us at the back of church to sound us out. But uh, John and Ruth went to the children's corner, or Ruth did, and she talked to one of the Cakes children who said, why are you here? And she said, my dad needs a job. So that <laughs> was the cover um, that we wanted, and we came in September. I think that's a good that's a good point to to stop with my my dad needs a job and and the rest is history in a sense isn't it 28 years of history coming coming out of that so yeah. what we'll do in our next interview is is really to begin to tackle the uh, the St Paul's years so so thank you Tony for sharing the insights from Ipswich and the insights from Barking uh, as we begin to look towards St Albans so thank you very much Tony Great.